Welcome to Andover Newton. We're the nation's oldest graduate school of theology and one of the best places to pursue your calling. There was a receptivity, not only amongst students in the community, but among faculty as well, to really articulate that call and understand how it is that God is working through us. Andover Newton means so much for me because in the first place, it's the oldest Protestant seminary in the country. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. started the uh, liturgical dance that is now international. There is a sacred dance guild and that is held every year. You know, even you know, theologically, God spoke and there was and, and is and um, and I think we're called to do that ministry, not to just uh, put up lofty ideals, but to really make things um, real for people and to, and to, to, uh, to bring uh, good news to them uh, in very real ways. Hello, and welcome to Careers That Matter, Andover Newton Theological School's first webcast event. My name is Ashley Gay, and I'm a student here. We are broadcasting live from the Mass Bible Society Media Center here on the Andover Newton Theological School's campus. With me today is President Nick Carter, and we're here to discuss careers that matter and how pursuing theological education can prepare you for your career goals without compromising what's important to you. Before we start, I'd like to point out that this broadcast has a chat feature, so please be sending your questions along. I will have my classmate Aaron Stockwell here at the controls. We will continue to answer your questions until 1245 Eastern Standard Time, at which point you can continue to send questions to the admissions office at admissions at ants.edu or on Facebook. Before we start, I'd like to begin with a prayer. You would all join me. As we gather now across the distances, we call upon God to be with us. God of love, spirit of understanding, we thank you for your goodness in the world. We praise you for the gift of life. We thank you for the fortune of having choices, and we ask for discernment in navigating our opportunities. Guide us to be honest, clear, and direct. Grant us grace as we consider our future vocations and inspire us to engage as we face our present world. Help us to create an atmosphere of loving kindness for all our brothers and sisters. Amen. As I mentioned, I'm a current student here in the Master's Program of Theological Research. My plans are to become a professor of theological aesthetics. Now, I know what you're thinking. Nothing could sound more theoretical, more removed from tangibly engaging what matters. But for me, the relationship that theology and aesthetics share is that embodiment. It's that tangibility. It's giving form to faith, embodying what you believe. And that's why I chose Andover Newton, because I feel that the faculty here and the coursework has prepared me to have an embodied ministry as rich and imaginative as my theoretical findings. But enough about me. <laughs> We're here to talk with Nick, and so I'd like to turn it over to him. Nick Carter, uh, could you share with us a bit about your theological and educational background, um, your professional background with our viewers? I'd be happy to. Thank, thank you, Ashley. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm one of those people who's had uh, many careers and one vocation. I've had the, the privilege to be able to work in the church and out of the church, in the nonprofit sector and in the private sector. Um, but all the way through, and I hope it'll become clear as, uh, as we talk, that there really is a common theme for all of this. And that, that's my own search for a way to uh, uh, live an authentic life of faith in whatever uh, circumstance I happen to find myself. 
Uh, my wife and I went to uh, uh, a seminary together uh, in upstate New York. Uh, I had been teaching high school. Uh, she was a social worker, and uh, we made the decision to, uh, to go to seminary together. Uh, and it was, a, it was an important decision for us. I had the opportunity to uh, study at a, at a school uh, that uh, also had trained Martin Luther King. And uh, since he had been such an important influence in my life, uh, I was able to uh, share some of the same professors, and uh, I felt it prepared me well for uh, the career that uh, I first pursued. Um, when my wife and I graduated, we started a, uh, a ministry from scratch. We, we began to work with young adults in uh, a really interesting neighborhood of Rochester, New York. And we started a coffee house uh, and a religious experiment, and we had uh, poetry and classical music and folk music. Uh, it was an exciting time, and we really had a chance to deal with people who had sort of been turned off to tra traditional religion, uh, but yet were still interested in trying to explore their, their life of faith. So for us, it was a fascinating time. From there, we found ourselves lured away to New York City. Uh, we, did, we worked, my wife worked in a, a prison ministry uh, in, uh, in New Jersey, and I worked at uh, denominational offices in New York City. And from there, I went to uh, the pastor of a local church in, in the North Shore of Massachusetts. It was a fascinating church, a church that is deeply committed to the community. It had eight different corporations, and it had a home for boys and a home for girls, uh, uh, a nursery school, uh, 200 units of low-income and handicapped housing, um, and then we created uh, a property management corporation to deal with all of those different, those different ministries. And for me, it was a, a chance to watch different ways in which a local church got involved in its community and cared for different kinds of people and watch different people relate to those different, those different uh, programs. I had, while I was a pastor, I'd been very involved in the peace and justice movement in the United States. Um, and through... Uh, an unusual set of circumstances, found myself called uh, to Washington, D.C. to become the executive director of the nation's largest peace and justice, grassroots peace and justice organization called Sane Freeze, and worked there uh, at the national and international level uh, for a halt to uh, the production uh, and distribution of nuclear weapons, and uh, that was an exciting and fascinating time. And. Uh, because of that, I developed some relationships with several foundations, and uh, they uh, uh, called me to my next uh, career, which was working with, with young organizations to try and help them uh, reach a level of sustainability. And so I worked with several nonprofit organizations, uh, and uh, they would helicopter me in, and I would try and work with them in those different situations. Ended up uh, working for a for profit company that built public-private partnerships, uh, tried to secure private sector dollars for public sector services. And it was from there that the folks here at Andover Newton found me. I had gone off to found my own uh, consulting business, uh, working with religious and educational nonprofit organizations. Uh, and uh, uh, I was able to discover in the midst of the search to come here that God had a, a very interesting plan for me to teach me these different skills in these different places so that I could put them to work here. So for me, it's been a fascinating journey to, in many different iterations and careers, but uh, all the while, a chance to discover myself and what it was that God had called me to do. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned something interesting at the, at the beginning and, and there at the end a little bit as well. This distinction between career and vocation, can you speak more about that? Sure, sure. I think there is a significant difference between the careers that we have, the, the things that we're, we're paid to do, and the deeper calling of who we are. There's a life journey that I think each of us goes through to discover this marvelous creation that God has, has made in each of us. And we then try and listen to our own heartbeat and, and, and try on different jobs. To, and we search, there's a search for authenticity. And I think that ultimately the goal for any of us is to be able to have a career that matches our vocation, that matches our calling. And uh, I think folks who find themselves with the highest levels of dissatisfaction realize that they're in a career 
that's far from their calling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, your career, as you pointed out, took on many forms um, to discern that calling and, and discern yourself. How does theological education prepare you for these new opportunities and these seeming divergences in, yeah. along the path? It, it, for, the, for me, for theological, educa theological education was the perfect place to begin because it enabled me to look deep within myself to the things that I held of greatest value, uh, to self-assess, uh, to ask the deeper questions of what had God created in me <laughs> with all of my faults and, and, and quirks, who am I? And I could, I could really begin to answer that question in, 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 a, in a thoughtful and reflective way and then begin to look at that question of the, the, give shape to my calling, to my vocation. And it helped me be able to discern different things such that when I was invited to try on different careers, I, I had a, a, a deeper keel in those changing seas about who I was and what was important to me and how, how I could make choices between one career and another as being more or less meaningful in my search for, for a fulfilling life. Now, these questions you mentioned, who am I, what has God created in me, seem very timeless, seem like questions we always ask. But I've also heard you say that now more than ever we need faith pioneers. Why now more than ever? We live in a remarkable time. Uh, there are so many challenges in our world. There's so much that's changing. Globally things are changing. Our nation is changing, the church is changing. Our understanding of, of, of how we relate to others on the planet is changing. And we're developing a global and, and uh, uh, planetary consciousness. And with it, we're, the standards that we're used to, even the careers that we're used to, are, are changing. And we need pioneers. We need people. It's not, it, the question is not so much geography anymore. It's a question of ideas, of understanding and perspectives on the world. We need people who have border crossing skills, the ability to work with and engage and, um, uh, and care for people who don't look like us, think like us, talk like us, or even worship like us. We need new pioneers, just as, as there was a different age where people were busy exploring new geographies. We have to explore new relationships. Uh, and find ways to, to, to build a greater, uh, as Martin Luther King called it, a beloved community. And we need people who are willing to take that on, to address issues of, of, of poverty and injustice and, and religious difference. Uh, and it, it, it concerns me greatly that you can't open a paper today and not find an article about the pain and violence that religious difference uh, is spreading in the world. And it, it, it begs the question, who will lead us? Who will help us? Where, where is the source of hope in the face of, of these, these tragic circumstances? We really do need people of faith who are willing to be pioneers and explore this, this, uh, this territory. I love that image of this ideological terrain that we're navigating now. Uh, and I know that a lot of people joining us today or in this moment of navigating the terrain of how do I m make these choices mm -hmm. in my vocational path, can you give any advice to them at this time? Well, um, everyone's p own path is different, so I'm, I'm a little, <laughs> sure. I want to be careful about, <laughs> about uh, a categorically uh, giving an, a, a advice. Um, I think each of us is, is on our own search for authenticity, uh, and I think it's important to take some time to reflect we live in a, in a fast-paced world, and often we're presented with choices, and, and the, the tendency is to want to grab one quickly and, and, and go. If there's an opportunity to explore, to reflect, uh, to prepare uh, before one dives in, I think it's really valuable. That's one of the things that we often find in students who come to seminary, is that they're, they find a yearning to, to want to do something important with their life, but they're not quite sure. And I welcome those people to come and, and use this opportunity to reflect a little bit and get, uh, get grounded. Uh, uh, because once we get out and get ourselves involved in something, particularly if we've chosen a career where we're trying to help others, 
if, if somehow we're wounded or we're, we're uh, uh, still a little bit lost, we're not as helpful to others mm -hmm. if we haven't taken the time to get our act together. And I, I've often said that we need to be in the business of getting our act together so that we can give ourselves away in ways that matter. Amen. <laughs> well, to wrap us up here, we're going to take some questions from you all at this time. So, Aaron, good. thank you. All right, our first question is, can you share some examples of people you know who love their jobs and have an MDiv but are not pastors? Great question. Well, I won't mention them by name okay. uh, <laughs> to, to spare them the embarrassment. But uh, I know people who, who worked uh, in, the, in the world of, uh, of, of public service, uh, social service agencies, uh, uh, and actually, it's quite remarkable when you go and ask people, where, where did you go to school? The number of people that went to seminary. Hmm. There are people who work in YMCA and YWCA. There are people who work in uh, city mission societies. Uh, there are people who work in peace and justice organizations. Uh, there are people who work in hunger programs. Uh, it, it's a remarkable number of people who went to seminary first. Uh, and. Uh, it, I think it's a testimony to the agility of, of a Master of Divinity degree uh, or just a, the, a, a period of theological study, how many of those people have taken their, their careers to different places. And there are people who work in the private sector, uh, uh, which I don't want to eliminate. There are some, there's a great need both for whether that's working just as an executive in a business or uh, some faith related, there's a, a whole new career of business chaplains uh, growing up, which I think is a fascinating career, um, as well as the traditional college chaplains or hospital chaplains and hospice workers. Uh, you, it's hard to find a profession that there isn't someone uh, who didn't go to theological school <laughs> along, along the way. And vice versa, we find them coming here. Right. <laughs> uh, we have lawyers here, physicians here. We, have, we even have a rocket scientist at one point, or true rocket scientist here. Wow. Each <laughs> saying, well, th th that whole question of, of authenticity, that the, the career they were in wasn't quite right for them, and they felt, they felt called to leave that career and come here. Next question. Okay. This one is, I am from the UCC denomination. What are the most important religious classes to take if I want to work in micro-enterprise in Africa? Micro-enterprise in Africa. Wow. Well, first off, for, for someone from the United Church of Christ, uh, you'll be uh, amongst a great uh, horde of your, of, of your uh, fellow uh, uh, heroes and sheroes here that... Uh, uh, <laughs> The Andover side of Andover Newton, of course, has its roots deeply in uh, uh, in the in the UCC, and we're covenanted to the UCC. Uh, we also have folks here who are not only from Africa but also seeking to work in Africa. For one, seeking to prepare in in uh, uh, in micro for micro businesses. Uh, there's some fascinating things I think that one one would want to do. One is, I think, is to uh, make sure that you've taken some courses in comparative religion, um, uh, because Africa is far from monolithic in, in the faith expressions, and anyone who's visited there is conscious uh, of, of the, plur the pluralism in, in, in Africa. I think there it's important to be tuned into issues of, of uh, social justice um, uh, and uh, the interplay of, of faith and justice issues. Uh, it's not just charity issues. Uh, and if this person is interested in micro-enterprise, uh, th there are some courses in business ethics here that are available. Uh, we have two marvelous ethics professors here that I think uh, one who's very committed to the biblical uh, uh, mandate to, to care for the poor uh, and has done her work there uh, and another who's from Africa uh, who teaches in ethics, and it would be, I would certainly recommend some of those courses for students that are interested in that particular group. And another question, let's see. Hmm, great question. Any times at Andover Newton you thought, I wish I had known 
that so I, that I wish I had I, known. I guess. I, <laughs> where, hmm, yeah. I, I, Things well, that you, you didn't anticipate, I suppose. Okay. Well, let me, I think there are, there are some things that, um, if you talk about students and their discovery um, uh, about theological education, I think for some, uh, there is a journey of faith that um, many people uh, would find that uh, they, they wish that they were uh, perhaps a little bit more rooted in their own faith tradition sometimes. Um, and uh, uh, because we're seeing an increasing number of people who, who have uh, uh, less traditional church backgrounds. Uh, and while they can thrive here, it takes them a little longer because they're coming to a, a theological school. Um, and I think that's important. I think for those of us who are part of the community um, are, are often surprised at, at the, what I call the hidden curriculum of a theological school. Um, there's the things that we teach in the classroom, and then there are the thing, everything else that you learn when you're not in the classroom, but you're here. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising sometimes to watch the, um, the, the way students create things uh, themselves and in a graduate school atmosphere is very different mm -hmm. than high school or college. Uh, people are much more directed and uh, much clearer about what they want to get. And so they'll often come together and create things on their own, discussion groups, uh, social groups and things, and it's often surprising to people. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if that quite answers the question. But, no, I uh, think yeah. that's great. That's a great to start on that question. <laughs> and our next question is... Is it ever too late to enter into the ministry uh, for the purpose of becoming a pastor? Another great question. Well, I can say that two years ago, I handed a diploma to a woman who was 72 years old and who is now working uh, as an associate pastor in a church. So, too late? Oh. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> uh, no, it's never too late. And you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that all of those who are involved in admissions here are just fascinated by the personal stories of people who come to seminary. As I mentioned, there are people who had successful careers in business. We've had venture capitalists come here and folks right from, from uh, working in a, law, a successful law firm uh, from, to physicians who have just walked away from those careers mm -hmm. with and they, they have a, a remarkable story to tell about how they've been wrestling with their commitment to care for others and feeling like the profession they were in wasn't quite the right fit for them. It's not so much a, a rejection of, of that career, but just for them it was the wrong fit. And so people will come here in their 20s, right out of college. Uh, there's a good, uh, good gaggle of folks who are in their 20s here, but there are folks in their 30s and 40s and 50s and... You know, not as many, but there are people here in their 60s and 70s. There are some folks I call passionaries. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're not even interested in traditional church roles, mm -hmm. but they have some real passion about wanting to make a difference in the world. And some, come to, some passionaries come to us right out of college, mm -hmm. but there are some who they've raised their kids and paid their mortgage, and then they're saying, you know, I have a real passion to want to do something with my life, and, and how do I tool myself up for that? And they find that seminary is the perfect plot, place to sort of bring their passion. Wow, I love that, that term, passionary. And like you said, it's never too late to integrate that career and root it into vocation. Our next question, ah, the opposite. Is it ever too early to go into the ministry? Ah. This is something you touched on earlier with the time to reflect before you <laughs> engage. Well, I think there's, there's part of a, a faith journey that everyone has. Uh, and there is, there is good Protestant theology uh, that, in a sense, recognizes that we all have a ministry in our work. I think there, there, there's a, an opportunity to to uh, demonstrate our faith, to give witness to the things we believe in uh, every day of our lives, and you could very easily call that ministry. Uh, then there are positions of leadership within the church or other positions that are more formal professional ministries. Um, and uh, 
there are people who, uh, who come here primarily for that. We have lots of lay people who have no interest in, in frankly, in a professional career in, in, in ministry, but their own personal ministries want to come here. So it's, you know, in one sense, uh, not too early. We are a graduate school, and so in order to be accredited, uh, we can only take uh, a small percentage of students, only about 10% of our students can be admitted who, who, who don't have an undergraduate degree. Now, fortunately, we can stay flexible enough in that 10% when someone comes to us with an unusual story that uh, we feel like they're mature enough and ready enough to, to be here, we can welcome them. So. Excellent. Well, we have time for one more question. Our last question for today is, why not just get a degree in public administration or social work? What's the difference between uh, that and a theological degree? Those are important degrees. And uh, uh, there are many people who have those degrees who are doing important work. The difference, I think, is the, the taproot and the resource of one's faith. If, if, if you're a person of, of faith, I think there is a, an added dimension that you can uh, bring to your career uh, that you can develop in a theological school that you can't with one of those other degrees. Uh, and I, I toured two third world countries for a year during a sabbatical and visited uh, education and healthcare delivery places and tried to compare organizations like uh, Oxfam and Peace Corps and, and others uh, with people of faith. And there's a remarkable difference uh, when you see a person of faith at work uh, in some of those circumstances. Because when di certain difficult circumstances arrive, they have this, this resource, this added resource, this taproot of faith to be able to draw on in their, in their work and sustain them when times get difficult. It also gives them uh, a much greater sense of personal integration of my faith, my work, uh, my family, all of those things that I think uh, that a theological education can do. Uh, so I get the chance to reflect on the deepest, most fundamental questions in my life at the same time that I'm preparing for a career, rather than to separate those. Right. Looks like we are actually out of time. Thank you for getting us started with these Great. questions Pleasure. and concerns that we have. Um, at this time, I would like to say one more thing before we let you go for the afternoon. Just to remind you, admission staff will be here for a couple minutes after our broadcast ends. But before we take a look at that, if you would look at these admissions essentials. I'm sure you're all having questions about these logistics. Andover Newton Theological School offers five different degree programs three Master of the Arts programs, a Master of Divinity, generally required for those considering ordination, and a Doctorate of Ministry. You can also enroll as a special student and earn a Certificate in Theological Studies. We are currently accepting applications for our summer term as well as for our Fall 2010 term. Applications may be submitted on paper or online. They consist of the application proper, some essays, letters of recommendation, and official transcripts from all the colleges and universities you have attended. An admissions committee reviews the applications on a rolling basis. You can therefore apply to enter in any of our four terms each year. Merit, scholarships, and need-based financial aid are available. For further information, please contact admissions at ants.edu or call 617-831-2430. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. On behalf of Nick Carter and the Andover Newton community, I hope to see you on campus soon. God bless.